Hello, good afternoon. Thank you for joining Japan Foundation London's online event. My name is Junko Takekawa, Senior Arts Program Officer of Japan Foundation London. This is a second session of our mini series, Finding Japanese Poetry, in which we aim to help you understand this exquisite art form from Japan. Most of you may only have a chance to read Japanese poetry in English or other languages, but in order to appreciate it, the skill and the talent of translators are essential. As we pointed out in last year's webinar on Japanese literary translators, you will read a text through the world of translators, even if their work is not noticed as much as that of the original authors. One thing, however, more curious about poetry translation is the way translators read and understand the nuance and meanings, as well as preserving the distinction, distinguishing style of original authors into a different language. Poetry has a short verse, but much implication because of it. For this session, we have invited four distinguished translators with long experience of translating poetry to discuss the process of poetry translations. They are Dr. Janine Beichmann, a respected translator and professor emerita of Daito Bunka University in Japan. Ms. Lento Takako, an award-winning translator of poetry from Japanese to English and vice versa, who is currently based in the USA and Mr. Yotsumoto Yasuhiro, renowned poet and translator who also spoke in a previous session yesterday. These eminent panelists will be led by Dr. Alan Cummings from SOAS, University of London, who also has a track record in translation. I would like to thank them for agreeing to take part in and sharing their knowledge with us today. Next, housekeeping matters. Today's event will be recorded as we are using the webinar function. Your names will not be viewable by other attendees. However, I strongly recommend you to keep your audio and video muted throughout just in case. If you have any question for the panelists, please use the Q&A function to send in your question at any time. The Q&A function, you can see it on the bottom of the screen. Remember that in this question may be seen by everyone else so that you can avoid a particular question placed by another person which you would like to answer or if it is the same as yours. Simply click the thumb up icon next to the question you wish to vote. Unfortunately, due to time restrictions, you, we, may be, we may not be able to pick up all of the questions you asked, so my apologies in, in advance. Lastly, as always, we will send you an online questionnaire, so please spare a short moment to complete it for our future event. That's all from me. So now I would like to welcome our all panel to hand it over to Alan to lead this conversation. Over to you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Junko, uh, and welcome to everybody and thank you for attending uh, today's, uh, today's webinar. Um, my name, as Junko said, is Alan Cummings. Uh, I'm a senior lecturer in Japanese studies at SOAS, the University of London. Um, I have translated a little bit of poetry. Uh, I translated a book for the British Museum called Haiku uh, Love, which is a, a collection of haiku and senryu uh, about well, love and, and sex as well. Um, and I'm, I'm really uh, delighted to be the moderator for today's uh, roundtable uh, discussion on the translation. Uh, of Japanese poetry. Uh, but let me begin by uh, giving you a little bit more detail uh, on our three panelists uh, for today. Uh, everybody has a, has a rich uh, breadth of experience in translating poetry uh, from Japanese into English. Um, some of our translators have also uh, translated from English into Japanese too. Um, so what I'll do is I'll introduce each panelist uh, in turn, um, and then they will read uh, one of their uh, translations uh, for us. Um, so let's begin with uh, Janine uh, Beichmann. Uh, as Junko said, uh, Janine is a professor emerita uh, of Daito Bunko University uh, in Japan. Uh, she's published wonderful uh, biographies and translations 
uh, by, uh, of, of Yosuna Akiko and Masaoka Shiki. Um, she's also translated Ooka Makoto's uh, anthology of classical and modern poems uh, by Japanese poets. Um, and her most recent publication uh, is a translation of Ozawa Minoru's uh, Well-Versed, uh, Exploring Modern Japanese uh, Haiku. Um, but today, uh, Janine is going to read um, a piece that she's translated uh, by Ishigaki uh, Rin. Uh, so Janine, would you like to turn on your video and uh, a microphone for us? Yes, um, I don't know why, but my video is not showing me. You can't see me. Oh, now I'm showing. Good. Okay. So may I start reading? Yes, please. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. Um, sorry. So the translation I'm going to read is of a poem, as Alan said, by Ishigaki Rin, a female poet who lived from 1920 to 2004. The title is A Comic Turn, and it is a parody of an old fashioned comic monologue rewired to evoke post-war Japanese society. It begins with a down and out peddler being advised by an older and wiser friend to try selling something novel, unusual, and mingling laughter and tears goes on from there to its tragic comic ending. A Comic Turn by Ishigaki. Look around you. Today there's a man who sells happiness and a woman who sings, buy my dreams. In business, novelty's the key. Take it from me, kid. Pedal suffering and you'll make a mint. I'll buy that, says I, and pile my old cart high with everything from a heap of family gravestones to my dead sister's love letters. Step right up, folks. What you see is what you get. Any of it's a safer bet than stocks. Sadness doubles, tribulation does too. Take this rope called kith and kin, swing it once and a child's born. Two swings and hey, it's a grandchild. Take this stone stuffed cushion here, barely room for a body to perch on. Sit on it three years and your hair turns white. Do I have any takers? The value of money, the value of property, the value of a graduation diploma. Why do only things like that strut the streets of our fair town? On this little plot of earth where intangible cultural asset and pious yak like that clog the air. Why don't the value of poverty, the value of size, the value of souls bereft of ambition fetch the highest prices? Give me a family of six living in a single room and I'll show you a fortune in tears, seven warehouses full. Think I'm exaggerating, do you? From a warehouse of tears, I swipe these little red beans, drops of blood. How about some of this sweet red bean soup? At 10 yen a bowl, folks, it hits the spot on a cold night like this. It don't appeal? Then I'll have a nip myself and hey, another. Thank you, Janine. That was that was wonderful. Um, next, uh, I'd like to introduce uh, Lento Takako. Um, she was born and educated in Japan and currently lives in the uh, in the U.S. Um, Takako-san is a, an award-winning translator of poetry from Japanese to English and vice versa. Um, she has uh, a volume uh, out by the Tokugawa period haiku poet, Yosa Busson, uh, but her main focus has been on some of the most distinctive and groundbreaking voices of 20th century Japanese poetry. Uh, poets like Tanikawa Shuntaro, uh, Tamara Ryuichi, Yoshimasu Gozo, uh, Kaneko Mitsuhara, uh, Shinkawa Kazue, and Nagase Kyoko. Um, and her most recent translation um, is uh, a small volume of Tanikawa Shuntaro's uh, Ordinary People that was published uh, earlier uh, this year. Uh, Takako-san, would you like to, to read for us, please? Thank you. Thank you for having me. And as you just said, the, the Ordinary People is uh, the book I'm using to read a poem from today. Title is Mars. Mars. 
in the cosmos of my heart, day is ending on Mars. Emotions I have never felt before silently tell me there mustn't be any trace of life forms there. The story started quite a while ago and will end any day. Words cannot find anywhere to settle down. So they drift in space. Isn't that silly? Human ears are simply of no use. Audible silence is tangible. Audible silence is tangled up with noise. Skin just might come in handy though, because it could help connect to another's allure. The concept of infinity, how trifling it is. Delusions of eternity keep spilling out of the world, voicelessly in secret Kishi is awestruck by the dusk on Mars. Wonderful, thank you, Takako. Um, and next, uh, I will introduce our, our final panelist. Uh, so Yotsumoto Yasuhiro uh, is, a, is a poet uh, and a translator. Uh, he has published a vast amount of poetry, uh, 13 volumes, I think, at the most recent Kant, um, as well as two novels, uh, and several works of literary criticism. Um, as a translator uh, into Japanese, he's translated Simon Armitage's Kid, um, as well as Stay at Home, uh, which is an anthology of COVID-related uh, poems from around the world. Um, and uh, recently, the poetic works of Homo sapiens, which is an anthology of contemporary poets from 22 different countries. Um, his most recent published translation uh, is the selected poems of uh, Shinkawa Kazue, uh, which he's translated together with, uh, with Lento-san. Um, so, Yotsumoto-san, welcome. Could you um, could you read a little something for us? I think you're going to read one of the poems from uh, the volume on Shinkar Kazue, aren't you? Yes, from this book. Well, thank you for having me. And uh, let me read a poem. A void. I am a container without a lid, an orphaned ball or a deep dish, ditched in a deserted lot. Yet when it rains throughout the night and finally stops in the morning, I can share the fresh blue sky with the water trapped inside me. Sometimes a dead butterfly or bird's feathers or an old contract long past expiration is thrown into me. But there are days of strong wind which will blow them away. No one bothers to look in, to give a thought. But when the moon sends its clear light to the empty bottom, I am so happy so joyful, I send back the moon's glowing reflection. Am I talking about discarded China? No, it's me, myself. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Yotsumoto-san. That was uh, that was wonderful. Um, okay, so um, I have I have a, a, a few questions. So we have um, we have maybe. 25, 30 minutes for, for questions, and then we'll, we'll move into the question uh, and answer uh, portion of, of today's event. Um, but the first question I wanted to, to throw out to our, our panelists today was to, was to ask you how you decided to become a translator of poetry. Um, that seems like a, a choice which is, uh, which is guaranteed to cause you a lot of strife and a lot of mental anguish. Um, maybe some joy as well, but it's it's also I think uh, it's not going to provide you with a, with a very solid living. So could you maybe tell us each of you uh, tell us a little bit about how you decided to become a translator and what that that particular journey uh, was like? Um, Yotsumoto-san, would you like to would you like to begin? Oh, okay. Well, well, unlike uh, Janine or Takako-san, I am not a translator by profession. I'm just a poet who's got, unfortunately or fortunately, addicted 
by this act of translation. And uh, I just love it. I, as, I, as you said, I mostly translate from um, the foreign language through English into Japanese. And I almost always try to do it together with the author, the poets. Um, so it's more of a collaboration and we sit down and go through line by line, word by word, so that I can really relieve that poem. And uh, then I spit it out in my own language, which is Japanese. I even sometimes translate just for the, the pleasure of myself, translate the Japanese poem into my Japanese, <laughs> either classic or the contemporary, just for the fun of it. And when I am translating, uh, no, when I'm writing my own poem, I sometimes feel I am translating something, something unspeakable into the language. So in my case, it's not at all so stressful. It's all joy. Good joy, fantastic, thank you. Um, Takako-san, could, could you maybe say, say something on that? I mean, you, you, you've translated so much. Um, so what, what, what got you started on that particular pathway? Um, uh, I was, I studied, um, well, I, I went to uh, the University of Iowa Writers Workshop on Fulbright. And because that, uh, I was writing English poems when I was in college at the creative writing class. So that was the beginning of my sort of journey into cross-cultural, cross-linguistic experience. When I finished MFA there at the workshop in poetry and translation, um, I was offered to teach in the, what was then called Chinese and Oriental Studies of the University of Iowa. But I thought uh, I, the Fulbright program required me to go back. So I went there um, back for a year, finished my master's in Japan and came back to teach and I was told I can teach anything I like, except that I had to, uh, that should include a civilization of Japan. So I started teaching the culture of Japan. And then I said, I would like to teach modern Japanese literature. And there are a few uh, good translations of novels, Tanikawa and Mishima and others. Uh, but I'm sorry, not Tanika, Ta Tanizaki and Mishima and Oe. So that was fine. But for the poetry section, especially modern poetry, there were no really, um, there was very few uh, scattered kind of translations and there were no material I could use. So I started translating the material to teach and that was run like a workshop. I told my students, these are the first or second or third draft of the poems. So give your input to these translations. And then that discussion expanded into how the poems may have been written, what the poet maybe have, may have been thinking, and may, maybe the expression here does not communicate that kind of thing. So I think, we had a wonderful session uh, in, in a poetry workshop type session through Japanese poetry in translation process. And that sort of got me to translate more and more of Japanese poems. And uh, after I stopped teaching, I was still doing uh, critical essays on, on American poetry kind of thing, publishing in Japan. So that also required translations to introduce or illustrate what I was saying. So that is where I really started translating back and forth between English and Japanese. Then um, I did not stop, even though I had my own business and all this and into the world and I was not into in the academy most of my life. But I thought that the two track uh, uh, taking the two track life in some ways and doing the literary translations and being in the business world. Um, I realized that um, 
you know, the poets are living in actual society in the world. Some of them are in the business world. So in some ways that I actually expanded my views of the world and the understanding of the poets. And that has been several decades since. And my uh, throughout, because I came to the States on the scholarship and helped by those um, other scholarships as well as a Fulbright um, fellowship, I always felt that I would like to contribute to bridging to cultures one way or another. So um, that it developed into trying to uh, translate poets work and then trying to publish books. And then to uh, my dream right now is to create some very good teaching material by working on um, anthology of Japanese poetry. And Yasuhiro and I are sort of trying to scheme some things at this moment. Well, and, uh, thank you, Takako. Um, so you, you, you've spent most of your working life in, in the US, and I think, Janine, you're, you're the opposite. You've spent most of your working life in, in Japan. Uh, so could you maybe tell us a little bit about, about your uh, route or journey uh, in, into poetry translation? Yeah, um, I never made a decision to be a translator. I was a graduate student trying to learn Japanese, and as part of um, seminars in Japanese literature, we had to translate that was the way we did it like when i was i was at columbia university and i was studying with donald keen and when we took his no seminar the way we did it is we would read a couple of pages of a no play come in um go around the table you know read our two lines translate our two lines which had probably taken us three hours to figure out and then you know keen would say it over um silently correcting us if we had a problem. And it was just so much fun. The term papers that we did for him were always translations, which was very unusual then and is still unusual now. He tremendously valued translation. So that kind of seeped into me and helped make it a lot of fun. Um, and then when I went further, I had write my dissertation, my MA and so on. He allowed us to do translations for the MA and in the dissertation, although it was a life and works, um, in order to write it, I, I couldn't just put, I did my dissertation on Masaoka Shiki, the um, father of the modern haiku, if you wanna have a little slogan for him. Um, and in order to, make my ideas clear. I had to translate, I don't know, at least a hundred of his poems. You couldn't do it. You know, we had six people at the dissertation defense and maybe one or two of them knew Japanese. So you couldn't leave the poems in Japanese. You had to translate them. And it was a big, it, it, there are many things that happened um, during that period that still are with me. For instance, the French professor at my dissertation defense kept referring to the aiku instead of the haiku, which struck me as very weird. And um, they didn't understand how haiku could be important. You know, <laughs> it was, there are all kinds of little stories that go on. Um, but because I was an academic, I had to do translation. And because I love poetry, I was never satisfied if it was just a literal translation. So that kind of the two things kind of fed into me. And so I, I um, yeah, so that's my journey. I wouldn't say it was a decision, but you know, Keen used to say that the big decisions that you make in your life are usually, usually unconscious. And so I, th I can think of a few things that happened along the way when I was pushed farther into translation and actually was making an unconscious decision to go deeper into this art. Um, there, there's no point in sharing them because it would take too long and it's you know, not gonna be true for everybody. But I think there are those things and we never know when we're deciding to be a translator, when we're deciding not to be, but to do something 
maybe more academic. So I'm sort of trailing off into nothing, but that's how it is. No, no, that 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 idea about the you know the conscious and the unconscious decisions we make. Uh, obviously, I mean, you were talking about your life, or Donald King was talking about life decisions there. But I think that's one that we can maybe kind of spin into. Uh, another question about about how poetry translation works, because it can often feel, I think, like this somewhat magical process, you know, where you you, you get this poem and it kind of it, it comes into your brain and it rattles around in your brain for for some time, and then eventually something comes out. There's some output that you feel is is partially right, usually it partially works, and then you you, you kind of polish it. So I'm I'm kind of interested in that in that process, like the process each of you have when you come to, to translate a new piece of poetry. I mean, you're, you're still both, you know, all of you are still publishing uh, new translations of, of poetry. So um, maybe can I just kind of go around again and kind of ask you, you know, when you come to translate a new poem, what is the process that you, you go through in terms of approach and kind of thinking and research and how much of it is creative versus how much of it is, is that kind of, hard background research going into into sources um and how you you know how you get to a, a polished final final version um takako could i maybe start with you for that one please okay um in my case that before that i really feel that the translator is just one of the readers of the poem or poetry i'm translating so first of all, first of all, I read and I find something that I really feel that I can translate and I want to translate. And the, after that, uh, I start examining, once I decide which poem to work on at that point, I start examining the words, wordings and the lines where the lines are broken and what is it are these mechanics are trying to communicate. And a good poem always has some kind of core of mystery in it, I think, and something you cannot pinpoint with words, with another words. So um, I try to get inside those uh, the mesh of words and the mechanics and see what's there. It is almost like I often talk about you know, a pearl diver that go down into the sea and look at with this little kernel of something shining. And that is, I don't know whether I can, uh, I would succeed in it or not, but I try anyway and come back up. And by that time, that process somehow is inside me already. So the one, by the time I come, uh, try to work on the words and the lines to translate. I try to stay close to the original, but I try not to do word for word kind of thing. But the feelings I got that the kernel I had has to come through with English language. That's how the translation, uh, that way, I think, um, in that way, I feel that I am a medium for conveying original translate, I mean, original poem into another, that poem in another language. And the trans, as a translator, I disappear. That, 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 that image of kind of diving for pearls is, is really beautiful, Takako, and it, it does kind of link, link us back to uh, Janine and and her uh, and her no translation seminars with with Donald Keane. If you think about the the no play Amma, um, Janine, can I maybe ask you the exactly the same the same question? What what, what does your process look like when you you have a new poem on the page in front of you? You want to translate it. What do you do? Well, I think a lot of what Takako said rang completely true to me. I was going, yeah, 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 um, but. Also, I think it's important to remember, and I'm sure Takako would agree, it's, it's different for every poem and every poet and every morning that you sit down at the table. So I feel a resistance to saying, this is my process. But, but if I look at it very objectively, then I know, you know, I do have a process. I choose something, I look at it, 
Um, usually I don't look up the words I don't know. There are a lot more words. I have a lot more words that I have to look up than Takako and Yasuhiro do. do, Yasuhiro do. And, but I, I don't look them up. I just, like, if I read Akiko's, Yosano Akiko's um, Tanka collection, I'll read like, you know, 40 poems in an hour, which is very, very quick. Even I don't think even a native speaker would do that, but I'm just doing the pages to see what jumps out. And if something jumps out, then I'll stop, you know, and I won't go back then, but I'll check it to go back later. So I try to get like, I guess I try to get a big picture first of the poem. And sometimes there's like a word or a phrase that leaps out and I know just how to do that. So I'll write it down very quickly and then I'll go on. And the funny thing is when I look back later, and if I don't see that little note I made, I don't usually know how to translate that part. Or if I do translate it, it's really awkward. But so that, fir that first um, collision, it's not really a collision, that first dance with the poem is really, I think, very, very important. So it, in terms of advice to starting out translators, I would say, don't think that you have to understand the whole thing when you're just reading. You can make your decision to translate it on the basis of something that just leaps out of, out of you before you really understand it. Then you can go on to really look into it. And maybe when you look into it, you'll change your mind and say, this is really stupid. You know, I didn't think it was like this. I made a mistake, <laughs> yeah. but, but sometimes it doesn't and it turns out to be really good. So I think I, what I'm saying is I try to keep loose and the part of coming really becoming really strict and seeing what a word for word would be or comparing my drafts with the original to make sure that they align, that I have included everything and I haven't added anything, that comes later. That's the, that's the um, I won't say drudgery, but it's the more, it's a different part of your mind that's going. You check, I'm checking up on myself. But when I first do it, I try to be loose and not check up, to be spontaneous. That 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 image of uh, of dancing with a poet or dancing with a with a poem, uh, I actually really like like that one as well. Um, you know, you're 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 adjusting to to a new partner, and they're adjusting to you in a way, and eventually you you manage to create something uh, something together. That's uh, that's that's really it's beautiful. Like Jacob wrestling with the angel. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yasuhiro, can I maybe throw the same question at, at, at you as well? What is what is your process like? We've 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 had dancing and we've had diving for pearls, but uh, well, I, I'm going to come up with a my version of the metaphor later. But let me start by saying that uh, the language of poetry is the language of symbol, uh, and in that it is essentially different from the everyday language, which is the language of logic and meaning. Um, so when you translate this poem, language of symbol and like a dream talk, um, you have, of course, first have to process it in your brain, but then you really have to bring it down to the deeper level of your consciousness, that just understanding what's there on a logical semantic way is not enough. You really have to feel it. It's something that a philosopher call qualia of consciousness. It's honest or thatness of the thing. When you really come down and, and touch it, then you re verbalize it in your own language. So whereas the translation of business letter or translation of textbook or handbook goes from A to B on a horizontal level, the translation of poem always come from up to bottom and then go from bottom to up and uh, when the readers read that, the same thing happens. They, if, if you read a poem or translated poem and only understand what's in there on a intelligent way, it's not enough. You got to feel it. Otherwise there is no point of reading uh, a, a poem. Um, so 
I guess this, um, you got to make a distinction between intelligence versus consciousness. And that's why uh, AI can translate um, beautifully for all the everyday language, the language of logic and um, meaning, but you got to wait for a C, artificial consciousness to arrive before seeing a um, automatic translation of poetry. Now, the image that I want to give you, Alan, is Ukai. Do you know Ukai? It's a, uh, a strange and very traditional way of uh, catching fish that you use a sea crow, a big fish with long neck, and you tie oh, rope right. around. Yes, um, and you tie a rope around the neck of those poor, um, the uh, the birds. I'm sorry, the birds, and the birds dive into the water, catch the fish. As soon as they catch it, you put them up and squeeze the rope so that they would spit out. When you hear that, you it sounds so cruel. But when I actually went to see it, all these birds are so happy and excited, especially after they got treated uh, some. Uh, real fish to eat. And that reminds me of a poet and also of the translator of poet. I thought, oh, that's me. And look how happy I am diving into the river and to catch the fish and not really swallow and digest it, but spit it out for the others to eat and cherish. So it's not as beautiful as the uh, pearl diver or dancers with poetry, but that's my version of metaphor. It, it, it sounds like it, it's essential for, for nourishment though. We, we, we all have to eat. Um, <laughs> right. Maybe, maybe one, one way we could develop this is, could, could I maybe ask you, uh, Yasuhiro, about your, your translation of the title uh, of the poem mm -hmm. by Shinkawa, Shinkawa Kazue that you read for us. So in Japanese, mm -hmm. that title is Kitsuraku, um, mm. And to me, you know, that word, it has a sense of, you know, something being missing or something, you know, lacking. We expect something to be there and, you know, for some reason it's not. And then we kind of say, you know, that's kind of kitsuraku. Uh, mm -hmm. But the English title you've, you've chosen is, is void. Can you maybe yeah. tell us something about that decision and the thinking, the thoughts or the feelings that, that went into coming to that translation? Right, right, exactly. That's the, the most... Uh challenging part of translating um, her poem uh, of Ketsuraku. Um, and I look up a dictionary for the English words of Ketsuraku. And as you mentioned, it's a gap or missing or lacking, a deletion, omission, uh, a want. None of them really fits the experience that I got from um, this point, from reading this poem. And uh, I was so tempted to ask the author, the poet Shinkawa-san and chat about it, but I resisted that temptation. And instead I tried to swallow the whole poem instead of trying to translate the title and I uh, tried to understand it. And somehow the word void came up. And I asked uh, Shinka-san, in my mind, do you think it's okay? And she seems to be saying it's okay. Now, after that, I realized, and uh, if you can show up the uh, Japanese text um, of, the, of this poem uh, on the screen, once again, that the, uh, there are um, this word, sora, uh, or ku, which is highlighted yellow in, in this slide in three uh, places in the first stanza as a part of Akichi, the deserted lot, a vacant land. And then in the second uh, stanza, Aozora, the blue sky. So this word ku can be read uh, both uh, sora as sky and aki, uh, or kara, which means empty. And then once again on the uh, fourth stanza, karapo, literally empty. So this image of 
uh, cool, empty, uh, void appearing in three places throughout this poet. And uh, in the end, she's saying that, are we talking about a China? No, it's about me. That she is saying that I am this emptiness, this void that swallows everything instead of I'm missing from here. Um, I am not sure yet whether that's a correct way of translation or not, but I chose that. Uh, and somehow this discovery of three emptiness or three ku convinced me that that should be okay. Excellent, thank you. Um, Janine, uh, I know that you also want to talk about one of the, one of the titles uh, for uh, a poem you've translated by Yosuno Akiko, um, one of her, her really most famous uh, poems, uh, Kimishini Tamao Koto Nakare. Um, could you maybe talk us through what the English title you came up with, or, or let us, let, tell us what the English title you came up with was and then how you, how you came to those decisions. Oh, you're, you're still muted, Janine. Sorry. Okay, am I unmuted now? Yeah, we can hear you. <laughs> so the English title is Thou Shalt Not Die. And it took me a long time to come up with this. Um, and I'll just start from the end. I finally realized that as Akiko often did, she took a Western, um, in this case, a Western expression, a Western sentence, and she changed it around to make it work in, in slightly different terms. And the expression that she took it from is the Ten Commandments. Akiko, by the way, when she was in her teens, was really fascinated by the Old Testament, especially the Song of Songs. And she read it so much that she said the cover was almost coming off, of course, in Japanese. So she was reading the Meiji period, the um, late 19th century translation of the Old Testament in Japanese. And in the Old Testament, the Ten Commandments, um, they, they appear in two or three places in the Old Testament, but the one in Exodus 20 in the King James version of the Bible, which is 16th century, um, is nanji korosu nakare, you must not, thou, well, thou shalt not kill is the way they say it in, in the King James version. Modern versions say um, you must not kill and variations. So, but when I discovered this, I thought, oh, how very much like Akiko to do this. And so I thought, you know, in translations until then of this much translated poem, poem had given its title as please do not die, my brother, you must not die. I beg you, brother, do not die, um, which all are kind of reading into the stark simplicity of the title, particularly adding the brother, which actually is not in the title, but in, in a kind of explanatory parenthesis that comes before the poem. So I wasn't happy with those. And I decided um, I'm gonna, and, and when I found out that it was really a kind of variation on this classical commandment, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not die. Um, she was actually saying that just as God commands you not to kill, he's also commanding you not to die. And that, this poem is often called a pacifist poem, but it really isn't. And Akiko was not a pacifist, um, but she had a way of arguing. It's very hard to explain, but she's, she's she, she said that this poem was like saying to her brother, go off, come back safely, saying just a farewell to, to, her, to her brother. Um, and so she's not, if, if she truly wanted to have a pacifist message, it would have become a political poem and it wouldn't be very famous now because it would be kind of boring. But she expressed her emotion, don't die, stay alive. That's your holy duty to stay alive. And what the consequences of that are was not really of interest to her. She was only interested in expressing her emotion. But at any rate, there's a little story connected to my choosing this title. Um, I was going, when I found out how close this was to the Ten Commandments, and uh, I'm sorry, I should add that Akiko, instead of saying nanji, which is the formal you, says kimi, which is an intimate 
um, form of you. And Shi Ni Tamo is a, is a, is a kego, is um, an honorific form of die. And, but, and so Shi Ni Tamo Koto, thou must not, thou shalt not die, thou must not die is how you translate it, but it has a slightly different feeling from the thou of thou shalt not kill, which is kind of formal. Akiko's thou is, is a kind of intimate. But anyway, when I had gotten this far and I decided, okay, I'm gonna do this as if it was a commandment from the 10 commandments, maybe let's call it an 11th commandment. Thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not die. And I couldn't decide, should I be modern and colloquial so it's easy to understand? And should I say, you must not die? Or should I be classical? And I couldn't make up my mind. So I asked my father who had a classical education in Hebrew, which I, you know, if it was different, which I should do. And he said, yes, of course it's different. <laughs> you know, how could you ask such a stupid question? You know, thou shalt not, that die is completely different from saying you must not die. So that made up my mind. And the, the thing that I'd like to say about this is that for me, with that poem, my father happened to be the touchstone. And I think when you're translating, there's so many times at which you don't know whether to do this or whether to do that. Yasuhudu's talking about, you know, void, do this or do that. Maybe you're not as indecisive as I am, but I always find there's a moment when I have to have someone who's a touchstone who I can trust. And if, I, if it passes them, then it's okay. I don't have to think about it anymore, even though I know other people are gonna you know, have things to say about it. So I think as a translator, it's very valuable to have a person who is a touchstone for you, a touchstone of value. But anyway, that's, that was a long story. It took me about, I would say, maybe 10 or 15 years to figure out how to translate that title. Not that I did it every day. <laughs> but I kept coming back to it. Thank you. Thank you, Janine. Uh, and finally, Takako, I, I wanted to ask you about the, the final three lines uh, of, the, of the Tanikawa poem that you, you read. Uh, in your translation, delusions of eternity keep spilling out of the world. Voicelessly in secret, Kishi is awestruck by the dusk on Mars. Um, Tanikawa always strikes me as a particularly difficult poet to, to translate. He's so mercurial, he's so shape-shifting, but there's always that kind of very, very distinctive and polished uh, line that he has in his in his work. And you get all of that kind of complexity around then the, the quotidian and the cosmic and all of those those things that you see in his poetry all the time. Um, but could you maybe tell us something about your, your approach to those lines and, and the type of voice uh, that you you hear uh, so frequently uh, with, with Tanikawa's poems? Thank you. Um... This Mars, the, the, when I saw the title, instantly I thought of his very first book of poems, the title of uh, the book of po his poems, that's uh, Two Billion Light Years of Solitude, was the, the published translation uh, of, the, uh, the, of the book. I mean, published, translated title of the book. And that um, Mars and his universe or cosmos is sort of a constant theme associated with him. And some people call him, he's from Mars, uh, because he is so outstandingly different from other people and in many different ways. But so Mars sort of, the title just called me, brought me back to that original title poem that was uh, written half a century ago, no, how many? 77 decades ago, isn't it? He was only 19 and he's now almost 90. So seven decades ago. And um, so the Mars is somehow the, the star in the universe, but something that belongs to his world. And his world was always as big as the universe. And he was, when he was young and um, uh, a dreaming kind of young man, he, uh, his universe was, his, uh, his universe was the, the biggest universe at, the, at that time. And that two billion light years was the, at, at, uh, when he was 19, that was the, the distance 
two billion light years was the distance from Earth to um, Mars. So with that distance being there, and it is full of hope, full of uh, the Mars was uh, the positive, another sort of second world to him. And uh, the Martians were there living the, like they uh, making living every day, just like we are doing. So he was, he had this very positive, friendly view of the Martians. Now in this poem, from the beginning, it's not the Mars up, up at the end of the universe or the, in, the in the middle of the expanse, but in the cosmos of my heart, it comes right into his heart. And delusions of eternity keep spilling out of the world. So the world has changed over the time over this uh, span of time. I usually do not read poetry in a sort of a personal relations like this, but it struck me that somehow that the first poem or the first poem, the world he created in the first poem and the, at the beginning of his career is somehow uh, placed in this poem as a shadow of this current poem. So I am not talking about his real life, but that in this poetic world, in this at this time of uh, poetic, uh, the, in his poetic world at this time, he is talking about a totally sort of distanced, different kind of uh, the worldview of this poet. And so the delusions of eternity keep spilling out of the world is that kind of the distance between, indicates the distance between the positive energetic view of the universe to rather shrunk in and inner inwardly focused kind of worldview. And uh, voicelessly in secret, Kishi is, it says uh, that the voice is not there in secret, in secretive kind of uh, the inward, uh, there's not many much of an energy, but somehow internally focused kind of world. And Kishi is the person's name in this, um, in one sense. This is a person, a person's name, and he is awestruck, awestruck by the dusk on Mars. So the Mars is the day of on Mars is ending, and that awestruck, but not in the sense of joining in, sharing the views, and you know moving outward. This is a totally inward kind of movement. Uh, in, uh, in terms of uh, negative energy, I think. And all this using all the images he has used over time. And uh, also one, I noticed that uh, in this poem, I translated this with I, this has something to do with grammatical discussions. And uh, in the cosmos of my heart, days ending on Mars, etc. All of a sudden, at the second last uh, line in the poem, Kishi appears. Kishi is a person's name. It stopped me and made me think, made me wonder, maybe I should translate that was he instead of I, and creating that, making it into Kishi's view. And probably that is also authentic translation, but I decided to stay with I because it, the experience up to that point is very immediate to the speaker. And so Kishi is awestruck, but Kishi is feeling it so immediately inside himself. But if that's the case, I is, still, I will communicate to me, the reader, that immediacy of that experience. I, 
Thank you. Th thank you, Zakuko. That's uh, that's really fascinating. You, you've given us um, so much uh, so much detail on on how you you approach that and the the ever difficult question of who's actually doing things in Japanese writing. All, all of those uh, all of those missing pronouns uh, that, that English speakers always want to add in. Um, I'm I'm very aware that we're we're running very short of time, so we'll maybe just have a, a very quick fire question and answer round. Uh, so I'll I'll choose a few. Uh, Two or three questions, and if uh, your if the panelists could try to answer them as succinctly as you as you can. Uh, so the first question I'm actually I'm going to throw at uh, Yasuhiro, um, and it's a question from Oliver T B, and he says, Japanese's use of kana and kanji adds another level of texture or nuance, which is difficult to map directly onto English. How do you get around this as a translator? Um, some uh, poets are very uh, strategic about using the visual aspect of the language, like uh, the kanji and, and kana. Um, and I probably choose not to translate that type of uh, the poems. I, I'd rather just enjoy it. But uh, others, like Shinkawa, Kaze, or Tanikawa Shuntaro, do not rely too much on this visual effects of kana and kanji's contrast. They go rather straightforward and they appeal to the reader through the substance beyond the linguistic expression. And that I would uh, prefer to handle. So uh, if I really have to come up with that problem, I would call either Janine or Takako. <laughs> Thank you. Um, one one, one uh, question for uh, Janine, which I think you can maybe answer very quickly. Uh, it's a question from Stephen Watts. Um, and he asks, are you planning on translating more of uh, Ishigaki Rin's poetry? Uh, because there isn't much out there and he would really like to read more of it. That's very kind of him. I have a whole manuscript of, of like 100 poems of Ishigaki, which I'm pulling into shape now. So the answer is yes, I have already, but Excellent. it's not published yet. Excellent. Thank you. That's something to, to, to really look forward to. Um, let's see. This, this question I think I'll, I'll ask to, to Takako. Uh, it's a question from Helen Parker. Um, all of the panelists have mentioned the importance of collaboration on their journey with poets, students, and teachers, etc. Is there something about the process that makes translating more collaborative than creative writing or academic study of literature? I believe so, because there are so many different kinds of, of uh, each reader reads poetry in different ways. So if that's the case, that the comparing notes would probably help. But again, each translator will come up with one's own version. So the number of translators equals the number of translations of one piece. Thank you. Uh, and let's see, uh, one maybe for Yotsumoto-san. Um, James Reeves asks, he's looking for Japanese translations of Robert Frost that are not just literal, um, but that attempt to capture Japanese forms and sensibilities. Do you know of any? Any uh, Japanese translation of Robert Frost? Uh, yeah, which, which use Japanese poetic forms. Hmm. Yeah, no. Uh, Takako, do you, do you, can you think of anything? No, I think it, I, I am totally against using any poetic forms into, uh, in, in translation, including haiku. Because writing haiku originally in English is fine, 575, but translating that into Japanese 575 is nonsensical, I think. Mm -hmm. Because you, you miss so much. Thank you. Um, and uh, one question from Natalia. Uh, I will direct this one to Janine. Um, what recommendations would you have for somebody who is aiming to translate uh, Yosana Akiko? 
uh, what uh, what is the hardest parts of trying to translate uh, Akiko's poetry? You have to know Bunga, classical Japanese, um, and not just the way it is in the really old things, but the way it was used in the Meiji period. Otherwise, you make all kinds of crazy mistakes. And um, you, you really have to study the tanka form. And I guess those are the two main things. Tanka form and classical stuff. OK. Akiko, um, classical Japanese. Well, Although it's uh, not the classical Japanese of the tale of Genji. I have to, you know, classical Japanese goes through many iterations. I don't know, Takako, what do you think of that? Would you disagree? Would you clarify? Uh, oh. You think I'm justified in saying that? Yes. Good, okay, thank you. <laughs> You're my touchstone. <laughs> uh, and I, I, I think you see another answer to that question that Helen raised about kind of collaboration happening here on the panel. Uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Junko, do we do we still have time for for one more question, or are we are we yeah, close yes, to our? Go ahead, go ahead. Okay, um, let's see. So uh, I'll I'll just throw this one out to to the entirety of the panel. So Tim King uh, has asked. He says he's an engineer, uh, but he works alongside a Japanese experts to write technical international standards in English. Um, what do the panelists think are the, the key challenges that Japanese people have when trying to express themselves in English? Um, maybe that's, that's a, a better question for Yasuhiro-san and Takako-san. No, I have, I have, I, I'm married to a oh, Japanese. Oh, you, okay, a, perfect. <laughs> the difference between L and R, work and walk. <laughs> I think that's a huge thing, but that's all I'll say about the question. Pronunciation, okay. Uh, Yasuhiro, yeah, what do you think? That particular pronunciation, L and R, it's very difficult. Um, I, I think in general, Japanese people are so much afraid of conflict um, that there is a constantly a conflict avoidance. And there are hundreds of ways of saying no without saying no. Um, <laughs> and, and, and I felt that more than 30 years ago when I left Japan and started living abroad. And I came back after all these years last year and I found that trend is getting even worse now than before. And Takako, what do you think? <laughs> it is, I think that the, the but the word orders, you know, the grammatically Japanese word orders are reversed. So we tend to express, express, I talk about the Mount Fuji and the flat, flattened uh, the mountains. We start from the field, you know, the surroundings and then build the conclusion. And the last is the word that will see, um, that will have, that is a point of the sentence. So if you interrupt them in the middle, you don't know what kind of this kind of mountain or that kind of mountain. And that is really the most difficult part of the communication, I find. It looks like Japanese people are dodging the, you know, the questions or something like that when they start explaining things. It is like the sentence and the Japanese sentence, the negative comes at the very end. So you don't know whether they're talking about no or yes, even if they are trying to be very straightforward. We're, we're, we're in a very different landscape indeed. Um, okay, thank you. Thank you, everybody. Uh, I think that's, uh, that's all we have time for today. Um, Junko, can I hand over to you to, to do your, your closing formalities? But yeah. thank you to the panelists. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. How can I say it? it was really interesting. I made a quite a lot of notes there from that uh, reciting poems and uh, analyzing that how you translate and, and towards that Japanese attitude and the handling of language was just so interesting. To be honest with you that I wasn't very keen poem reader uh, as a child. I hated it, to be honest, by reading lines. And um, I just didn't understand what they, the point I wanted to say. But, you know, hearing today that um, knowing that uh, what you, how you actually approach the poems 
and the how you uh, read a poem actually helped me to probably revisit poems later and then try to sort of, you know, appreciate um, the poem. As Yotsumoto-san says, not just the understanding intellectually, intelligently, but you need to feel it. That's probably, you know, interesting, you know, um, advice. And also that um, many languages you use, dancing, diving, all sorts of, sort of, you know, um, um, that's a quotation, really interesting. So thank you so much for all of you to join us for this inspiring session. And then also thanks to Alan to keep this event going, understanding what a translation is about. I am sure everybody appreciate that. So um, unfortunately, we don't have much time for it, um, for this session, but unless you want to say something, last word, you know, Alan, Takako-san, and uh, Yotsumoto-san. Uh, Just one word from me. Yeah. Okay. Poetry, as Junko said, is for everybody, for the ordinary people, and this is the cover of uh, Shintaro's latest translation that uh, Lentil-san did. Thank you, Yotsumoto-san. That is a wonderful book. It's very short, very thin, that is, but it really gives us a sort of the parade of people which, who becomes not really Japanese per se, but everyone in the world or even in the universe. This is Kishi, I think. <laughs> <laughs> you think so? <laughs> Jenny, do you have any last word to say? Just thank you very much. It's been very, very enjoyable. I love having these round tables and hearing other people's experiences. And I hope it's helped some of the people who are thinking of translating to translate themselves. Just go ahead, do it. Thank you so much for your encouraging words. And that's all from us. And then I have to say, unfortunately, bye-bye the moment. Bye-bye. Have a nice afternoon, wherever you are.